You see, something's going to happen. What? What's going to happen? Something wonderful. What? I understand how you feel. You see, it's all very clear to me now. Welcome to the Occult Rejects. On this episode, I got Mario from Symbolic Studies and I got Megan from Seven Degrees of Wisdom. I'm sure you all know them already. Um, I have done a tarot series with them. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Didn't we cover something else? We covered St. Hildegard's stuff. And yeah. uh, today we are going to be covering some of the emblems uh, that are in Michael Myers' uh, Atlantia Fusions. Um, I already forgot the dude's name. Uh, maybe I'll remember one of them do. Um, the emblems aren't actually made by him. They're made by somebody mm-hmm. like Matthias or something like that. But um, yeah. n- n- nonetheless, they are in his book. And uh, I thought they were really amazing. Um, I had covered this book. It probably came out about two months ago. So if you're interested, you might have to go back and listen to that. Uh, there's two episodes. Um, Megan will be doing like a brief introductory you know, about the book itself for people who don't know who it is and for the new listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is very, you know, in my opinion, it was a very deep and in, inculted book. And uh, when it comes to art and trying to decipher art, just for me, the two people I think about is Mario and Megan. So, uh, and I know that they also appreciate the art. So I'm like sending them the stuff. I'm like, oh, you got to look at this. <laughs> Getting all excited. And I was like, yo, we should really uh, cover these emblems. And uh, and I'm hoping in the future we may do it with Heinrich Kuhnroth as well. I think that mm-hmm. stuff is even more detailed. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, so I wanted to get the three of us together and kind of just, you know, this is how we see it. If I'm right mm-hmm. or wrong, I can't say. I mean, probably a better chance that Mario and Megan might be right. Um, but you know, these are, this is how we see it, you know, um, and I'm pretty sure I can speak for all of you is this, this isn't set in stone and gold. These are just our theories and our opinions. Uh, and I think with that said, I think it's time to move on and, uh, we'll just go with you first, Mario, let everybody know, uh, especially for all the new listeners I've gotten recently, let everybody know, please, uh, who you are and what your deal is. Yeah, for sure. So my project is called Symbolic Studies. You guys can find all of my stuff at symbolicstudies.com. And what I do is essentially follow each sign during the sign itself. I use the tropical system um, when I publish content, essentially. So right now I'm putting out information on cancer, and I'll be doing the same thing for Leo. And I've been at it for about four years now. And um, I republish my videos, too, and I update them and edit them. But if you're interested in following the signs and kind of having a deeper awareness of that, um, you know, you can follow my accounts. I'm on YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and all of that. I also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash symbolic studies. And right now I'm actually following the major arcana. I'm producing, uh, basically a presentation every other week. And for the first 22 episodes, I'm calling this series symbolic secrets for the first 22 episodes to do, um, one hour essentially on each card. And it's been a really, really fun exercise. And so every time you go through the major arcana and you kind of, you know, look at each card um, and really dive into it and revisit some of the material about it. You kind of see it with a whole new lens, to be honest with you. So I feel like every time I've done this, I've done this a few times now throughout the years. I feel like I always just kind of pierce the veil just a little bit deeper. And so these are like my latest insights about each card, basically. Yeah, definitely suggest to uh, check out his uh, social media, the little shorts that he makes for these things. I mean, first off, I think they're just top quality done and the, you know, just production wise and visual wise and very well done stuff, Mario. I highly suggest right on, to thanks, check man. out his his social media. It's one of the few accounts worth looking at. <laughs> <laughs> i'm excited Sorry. about it like i'm jazzed i told him um i think i commented on, on one of his posts and i was like yes man this is so cool i'm so excited to see what he's what he's got going on mario's stuff is always so awesome guys check it out you're, if you're not you're missing out yeah and Maybe uh thanks. megan let everybody know what is your deal and what's going on Hi guys. So I know I've been on the show before, but just really briefly, um, I'm seven degrees of wisdom. I run my own business. I am a practicing occultist. Um, I practice high magic or ceremonial magic. And so that's the lens that I'm going to be coming from this today on, uh, this symbology that we're going to be talking about. 
Um, I'm a professional intuitive tarot reader, paranormal and spiritual consultant. Um, I'm an instructor on cult subjects. I teach classes. A lot of them are on my YouTube channel. Um, I also do mentoring as well. So if you guys are interested in any of my services, I can do everything online. If you're local, you can come to the place where I work at. Um, so I'll have all of my links in the video description if you guys want to get a hold of me um, for any of my services. Um, and so basically, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and I have my own YouTube channel as well. Um, I will be posting this on my channel as well. It's uh, 7 Degrees of Wisdom 81 is the tag for it. And once again, I'll have all the links down below. I'm um, super excited to get into this. This this book was probably the funnest project I have ever done. It took me down all kinds of rabbit holes. Light bulbs were going off. I mean, it was absolutely the funnest one that I've done so far. Um, I highly recommend checking this out. There's a uh, furnace and fugue is org is the website where you can find this project and it's absolutely amazing. I read it top to bottom because I couldn't stop. It was just fantastic. So awesome. I'm glad I'm really, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely, um, I will have to say, I will admit, um, you know, when eventually when I was like, <laughs> I even had totally different emblems in mind. And when I had the idea, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, like, sick. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. And then I started looking at the emblems, and I was like, God damn. I'm like, this is yeah, going like, mm -hmm. to be time-consuming. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, and I really, like, and I'm like, I think I might be even, like, be picking the ones that are, like, really, like, I'm putting it, putting too much on myself, too. But I was just like, all right, I got this, I got this. But, yeah, um, yeah. once it was done and over with, I was actually very happy I picked it and really excited i will have to say it's i was just extremely excited to finally make this happen and to, to yeah. be finally working with you two again i was just looking forward yeah to that. absolutely i've missed you guys oh yeah oh yeah yeah we, i feel yeah. like we always no, just likewise. have great chats all right uh so before we get into the emblems do you do you want to uh just touch on some of the stuff yeah Megan? yes yeah so i'll um I'll go ahead and talk about the book itself so it's super interesting because the book itself is actually a puzzle it's meant to be read in a non-linear way. It can be read horizontally and, or vertically. Um, there's no single way to read the book. The open-ended nature of it allows the reader to discover an infinite number of links, layers, and hidden meanings embedded in the deliberately um, uh, embedded in it to deliberately resist any possibility of solving the puzzle. So skipping around turns the book into a tool, an instrument for multiplying me meanings and endlessly generating new ideas into nature, and even producing valuable chemical materials in the laboratory. Um, it was made uh, to touch on um, all three levels of the senses for a cohesive reading experience. It provides three different kinds of mental activity, meditation, understanding, and distinguishing. It's supposed to provide a multidimensional experience visually, um, auditorily, and engage the mind with puzzles so you can think outside the box, literally and metaphorically. And he wanted to create this book that would give everyone the opportunity to be able to study these alchemical concepts because back then you had a lot of people that were not so well versed in the literature and the symbolism and all the occult practices. So he wanted to create something that would really engage everyone and get them to think in a completely different way. Um, he writes the book in a, um, a, a, a mytho-alchemy theme to make it more palatable. This literary genre has been called the Hermetic Mythology, or even more recently, Mytho-alchemy. It worked on the premise like uh, that of the myths of Egyptian, Greek, and Latin antiquity, and they were repositories of alchemical secrets, coded narratives of natural philosophy. Uh, Meyer was interested in the chemical gods, or the indeed the principal intellectual chemical gods, Osiris, Isis, Mercurius, and Vulcanus, um, who are not celestial, but rather subterranean, born of the arts. Um, Egyptian Isis is identified as Greek Ceres and Osiris, as Bacchus or Dionysus, chief of the golden gods. Osiris is explained to symbolize the matter of the art from which the gold medicine is composed. The death represents the alchemical process of solution. The tomb in which the dismembered body is placed in the fiery and furious spirit. Typhon is the alchemical vessel. After the solution, Isis collects the parts and unites them with the combustible sulfur, such as the soul of Osiris becomes sufficiently ardent that he converts Isis, 
mother, wife, sister into himself, resulting in the ultimate hermaphroditic or androgynous perfection. Um, so this, the emblem that I'm going to be covering, um, it's really, it has a lot to do with analysis of the keyword and the rose cross ritual as well. Um, but I just wanted to give people like a brief rundown of the book itself. I mean, it is a massive compilation of work. It, a lot of work went into that. It's, it's absolutely just like mind boggling how much information uh, was in this work and how hard he worked to really um, explain alchem alchemy in, in a way that a lot of people could understand. And he actually had music that went with each emblem as well that you could listen to. You can actually listen to the music too. If you visit the website, um, you can, you know, look at the emblem, listen to the music that goes with it and then read the synopsis. So it's just, I, I just loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, you're welcome. All right. So like I said, I think we'll just probably go in emblem order and then uh, that will, I guess I started off then. Oh, uh, and here we go. Um, this is emblem. Oh, you know, something I did want to mention before we even get into it. Uh, that is something, uh, you know, you had mentioned about it being out of order. Um, mm -hmm. Between that one and uh, another reason why I kind of wanted to even cover the Heinrich Kuhnroth ones is because those books, it's almost kind of very close to like the Ninth Gate where like those books, the emblems aren't even in the same order in those books. Each right. book is actually different. The same shit is in there, but they're not in the mm -hmm. same order. So it's like, you know, how do you know, like, which one is even, like, you know, again, you have to figure out which which order the emblem's even in. I find that very interesting. And it is yeah. very, like, Ninth Gate-ish. So I do think that's kind of yes. cool. Something, yes. something to mention there. Yeah. But, you know, did they get an influence in that movie from, like, these books or something, you know? Oh, absolutely. They had I had wondered to. about that, know, yeah. All this stuff is connected, and for you to get a full picture of what mm. they're trying to explain, you've got to read all these different grimoires and, like, be very knowledgeable in a lot of different um, areas of subject matter. And so this book was written in that way. I mean, you could read it so many different ways. You can bounce around. It's not necessarily in any kind of order. Um, so that's I, I found that interesting as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, so uh, to get into this one, um, I, I do think, uh, yeah, this one going forward, I will get into kind of like, I mean, people know how I get with the cult uh, symbolism lately. You know, I, I'm trying to work in like body parts. Um, I will get into like the pineal gland and other stuff off of this. Uh, off of this. So that's kind of where I'm going with this stuff. Uh, emblem two of the secrets of nature, and that is the earth is his nurse. And epigram two, which is kind of like what goes along that little paragraph you see on the bottom. It says, a courteous wolf to Romulus displayed her milky dugs. To Jove a goat, tis said, nor is it strange to assert our mother earth gave suck to the tender philosophic birth. If breasts so small, heroes so great could breed, how great will he be whom the earth doth feed? And uh, even sounds like like the guy was like dropping bars back then too, right? And <laughs> guy oh, yeah. was like spitting bars back then, rhyming and shit too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, uh, and then and, you know another thing with these uh, for people who don't know and didn't hear it uh, from the original two or three episodes we spent on him, um, this does go along with music. You might have mm -hmm. said it before. I'm sorry if I forgot. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, music is played. And uh, I did find it interesting that, you know, it does mention Romulus and Jupiter, even like in the music being played. So I did want to show that. Um, the first thing I thought of when I saw this, and again, it's probably just because of my predisposition with the OTO and being into Thelemic magic and, you know, uh, looking into Crowley stuff. Um, I automatically kind of thought of the, the NOX signs and, uh, you know, Isis rejoicing and when you do that uh, during, like I would do that during like if the star ruby, because now you start using Crowley's rituals and those have a totally different formula. If you start using the NOX, uh, when you do this, you will grab your nipple actually and kind of lightly pinch it and act like you're holding a child. And, uh, mm. you know, so like that really did, you know, just that's one of the first things I thought of when I saw this. I'm like, oh, that's kind of like part of the NOX. 
Uh, and you know what it does say right here? Uh, that's also AA grade uh, 83. That would go with Bana. So um, you know, doing mm -hmm. this sign even goes with that grade. Um, the description, again, head looking downwards. The right hand pinches the left nipple while the left hand cradles just below solar plexus as if holding a baby. So just wanted to show that. Um, so now I sort of like g thinking about things that we have mentioned on the occult rejects. Um, really, I you don't know, have to kind of like give credit to Lisa. Um, there is actually something to do with a connection with the nipples to the pineal gland. So that did start making me think about like parts of the body and maybe even different names for <laughs> breasts, teat, uh, tit mm. with three T's used to be used actually. I learned that when I went to go Google the word tit that uh, originally it had three T's. Um, and then so, you know, I ran some of those and then I will get into other stuff, but I, I do mm. think I might have, I don't know. It just, I started finding weird things. Uh, so I ran teat. Um, that does match uh, Apple, Lion, Snake, Owl, Nazi, Fatima, uh, Lens, a part of your eye, uh, Shin, Dalith, Resh. Shin is on the Judgment card, Dallas is on the Empress card, and Resh is on the Sun card. So, like, you know, I'm even wondering, like, if somehow some of these body parts are actually being included in here, could you even be trying to, like, would that be telling me that maybe those three ideas are even in this one image. You know what I'm saying? Like, who knows? I, I could see that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. it's like almost oh, yeah, like totally. you took three tarot cards and squished it into one emblem. You know? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, you know, I just took that into consideration. Uh, breasts in simple gematria equals 84. And matches in simple would be Austin, Apophis, Pluto, Mona Lisa, Lumens, which I did find interesting because that is like a way to actually measure, I think, uh, strength of light in light bulbs. Uh, Kronos, Astarte, Vampire, Red Rose. A lot of these things mm. m that I'm matching now might seem also more significant later down when you start. In my opinion, you'll start seeing play on these words again. Um, tit in Hebrew gematria equals 309, and that matches in Hebrew Dracula. Mm. Now, I just mentioned vampire for breasts. Now I'm saying tit in Hebrew matches uh, Dracula, Utah, uh, Amphalos, which is a religious stone artifact, and in ancient Greek, it means the navel. And it also matches Inpu, which could be Anubis. Uh, Anubis. Tit in simple gematria equals 69, and that matches Eclipse, Texas, now, before in simple up breasts, you had Austin. There is an Austin, Texas. You get Mexico. Lions. Before I had teat, that was a lion. Now tit, lions, snakes, apples, pretty much plural of everything I said in teat. Um, you do get black hole, Pandora, and Mithra. And I did even find interesting that you do see, uh, like even, kind of even on this page, you do get the number 17. I don't know if that was any significance. And you do kind of get two of the two pillars. Wanted to include <coughs> that. You never know if sometimes even the, the number of, of the pages have something to do with it. I do know that uh, I think in the Book of Lies, they will say that in the commentary that even the, like the numbering of the pages and chapters and certain things are done on purpose. Uh, one thing I just thought was interesting, Michael Meyer, M.M., Mother's Milk, M.M., uh, he does reference to Milky Dugs in the epigram. Dugs in Hebrew, uh, Gematria, equals 308. That matches Photon, Tooth, which made me think of Dracula and Vampire again. Final Boss and <laughs> Shepherd. <laughs> uh, Dugs in Simple Gematria equals 58, and that matches Teeth, Kadosh, Fatima, which means a woman who wings her child, the name of Muhammad's daughter. So I even found that interesting. Also, uh, it's also a Muslim or Arabic uh, baby name. And it does also equal a star, which kind of makes me think of the Milky Way. <laughs> Science yes. mm -hmm. and Zodiac. Mm -hmm. So I was starting to wonder, like, you know, this is just, I just found it weird going, you know, running these things. Um, and then this is like kind of like how I'm going to try to explain it the best. 
Well, Lisa's in the chat, possibly, so she might be able to correct me if I screw up the notes. But um, when it comes to the pineal gland, the pineal gland with uh, melatonin has been shown to significantly influence sexual reproduction, pregnancy, and lactation by dictating function and physiology by regulating hormone release in the hypothalamus, pituitary, and sexual organs. That's including mammary glands and breast tissues. Uh, the pineal gland and mammary glands during lactation. Maternal pineal melatonin increases during pregnancy to promote increase in mammary gland development and growth. So basically, she knows she's pregnant. Her pineal gland is going to tell her boobs, it's time to start growing, and we're going to put some milk in there. Then uh, maternal melatonin influences development and programming of neural and brain development in nursing the infant. So even less stuff that this kid's going to be taking in from there is even going to start regulating this kid's growth, its sleep. So, like, it's a, actually, in my opinion, you are seeing, like, a connection from the pineal gland of the mother influence all the way down to the child, in mm -hmm. a sense. Um, I don't know if I was getting that deep with that card, but, um, you know, and then even the child putting its teeth again. Well, that's the second thing. At that point, hopefully you're taking the kid off. Uh, you know, if it's, you know, grabbing its its nipples, again, that's that even is telling the, the mother, the pineal, by the pineal gland, oh, you got to grow and milk, make milk. So it's even like a symbiotic relationship here between, like, a, the pineal gland and stuff going on. So, uh you know, again, Makes sense. with occultism, I, I do question, you know, pineal gland. That might be something that's, you know, come up. Um, so, who knows? So, I went there with that. Uh, then I had just wondered anything, you know, again, we were talking about teeth. I don't know. I found this weird. I have no idea if it had anything to do with it. But goats lack upper front teeth instead having a tough toothless dental pad. They have 32 teeth, including 24 molars, Four canines and four incisors. Kids, baby goats, are born with eight milk teeth arranged mm -hmm. in four pairs on the lower jaw. And that made me think very much of like Tahuti or Hood, um, eight. Uh, an adult wolf has 42 teeth, 20 on the upper jaw, and 22 on the lower one. And wolf pups have 28 milk teeth. Mm -hmm. And I've said myself, I even thought that the whole path of a Tahuti would go from two, four, six, and eight. So, I mean, those numbers came up, so I included this, and I just thought it was weird. I don't know when I added it in there. Have really, it could literally have nothing to do with, really, the card, but this emblem, but it's interesting to me. Um, Jove in simple gematria equals 52, and that matches door, ampu, devil, staff, Aries, and a whole bunch of other things, abracadabra, Romulus. That equals uh, the Mobian gland, which that is uh, inside your uh, eye, I'm pretty sure. Mary Magdalene, Neuralink, Adrenochrome, Star of David, All-Seeing Eye, King James Bible, April 11th, Tribe of Judah, The Red Dragon, Frankincense, and Milky Way. Wow. Mm. Nice. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't get into it, like I said, with too much. I was, like, trying to actually, like, explain, like, what the art was. But, like, I really did just try to uh, look at it from, uh, I guess... The biological aspect with the nipple and the pineal gland and I guess maybe just running certain things that started to seem a little shady to me. That's yeah, shady, interesting. Yeah, right, right. That's yeah, I'd love to jump there. in here. Uh, really, all of these emblems are super fascinating and as it's already been pretty much conveyed, uh, multi-layered, multifaceted, right? There's just a lot going on. <clears throat> so really, this is all about mother, right? Mother's milk, as you said. Um, you know, there's some esoteric tarot decks where the star card, literally the stars in the heavens are coming from the breasts of the great goddess, right? And um, the card I'm thinking of is Lon Milo Duquette's card. And so that figure there is very much associated with Babylon as well. And so everything about Mother's Milk and the Milky Way galaxy, very, very relevant, right? Um, and so we're actually seeing three mothers here. So we're seeing Mother Earth. So this would be Gaia, right? And then that is obviously uh, a wolf, a she-wolf, and then a she-goat as well. So these are all moms, and they're all breastfeeding, obviously. To me, it's interesting that Romulus is mentioned, but Remus isn't mentioned, um, because Romulus and Remus are the hero twins of Rome, and they suck on the teats of the she-wolf. That's like their most famous sort of like statuette kind of uh, motif 
is uh, underneath the uh, the teats of this she wolf. And so to me, I see that as being very much related to Gemini symbolism, which is kind of interesting, too, because this is emblem two. And so Roman numeral two would literally be the Gemini glyph. Um, I just mentioned the star card and it being related to breast milk. Um, and that's the 17th card of the major arcana, too. And just like you said, there's a number 17 right there. I'm really glad you mentioned the Omphalo stone because that's something that I'll be mentioning when I go over my glyphs. And as you mentioned too, it relates to the navel and her navel, her actual belly button is covered up here. And so, but doesn't it look like there's concentric rings around what would be her navel? And so uh, this would be the center of the earth. And that plays a huge, huge role in the emblem that I'm going to be talking about. So I think that's kind of curious. Um, it's the point of pivot. And so from my perspective, it kind of looks like they're trying to show the navel of the earth actually being the north. I don't know if those continents kind of lay out like that, but they're kind of implying that the navel of her body of Mother Earth has a point of pivot, has a sort of sacred center. Right. And so I think that's kind of interesting, too. Um, and, you know, I'm always looking and tracking northern symbolism, polar symbolism. I, I can't not get into that because I think it's a huge foundation of pretty much our symbolic language. And so it's interesting to me that nipple is very close to nipple, uh, nip pole, as in the, the nipple itself being symbolically sort of a pole. And then you just look at a breast. It's very polar in nature. It has that sort of sacred center, as the eye does, too. A lot of your eye symbolism, I love it. Because in my mind, I kind of translate it to polar symbolism, yeah, essentially, I could see that. with the iris in the middle and yeah, everything yeah, else, yeah. right? Yeah, it does work well. And so there's a lot going on there. Um, but that's pretty much it. Those are the main things I kind of wanted to mention. Uh, also, Mother's Milk, the, the letter M, very, very feminine. Uh, the Virgo glyph in the Zodiac is an M, right, with a fish attached to it. Um, we also have Scorpio, which is also an M. M um, is the 13th letter. The number 13 to me is a very feminine number. That's why it's kind of frowned upon in a lot of uh, civilizations and, and countries and things like that. It's kind of looked at as like an unlucky number. It has to do because it's actually a more of a feminine number. It kind of breaks a solar paradigm, in my opinion. And it relates to the death card, too. So like transitioning to the other side. So there's more of like kind of a chaos or a darkness, primordial feminine sort of energy to the number 13. And so anyway, and then um, in Hebrew, M mem right that's uh water if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. so very feminine element thank you thank you you know yeah, one yeah. thing i did want to i think uh, i totally forgot to mention and that's another reason why i had two and 17 uh circled you know i don't know if it means anything but uh on lines two and 17 and alistair crowley's 777 janice uh, when he goes to, when he talks about gods uh that he does fall on those two lines uh, I, you know, I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Uh, I know, like, I have also... It, this is really weird, and I, now I'm going to have to try to find the picture. Um, I know I've showed it to a few people. It, I'm not making it up. Um, I had also thought that uh, when I had covered <laughs> Michael Myers, uh, the, um, the actual, like, uh, killer in horror, uh, I thought he was very much of, like, a beast uh, kind of mm. uh, entity. And mm. when I went to Salem, I shit you not, it was the weirdest fucking thing. And, like, I already knew he was on lines. Janice was on lines 2 and 17 because I started seeing Janice symbolism in the movie. And uh, I covered it in the show. Uh, I shit you not, when I went to Salem and there was a dude standing out in the streets dressed <laughs> up as Michael Myers, he was under the fucking address 217. Mm. Dude, it blew wow. my fucking mind. I had to take a picture of him just to get the address <laughs> in the background. I was like, yo, what the fuck is this? <laughs> it was just like a mind blown. Man. I was like, what the fuck? I don't know. Very yeah. weird. Very weird. And I was so just he, like, yo, did he know that too? And that's why he stood here. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. Yeah, it was just really weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so two seven, yeah, two and seventeen. For some reason, Janice does fall on that. And again, uh, I don't know that maybe that could mean something. Who knows? I did want to mention that. Um, Megan, was there anything you wanted to add before we moved on? No. Okay, no, all right, that's fine. I wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're on to emblem nine. 
Okay, so this one was one that I picked. Um, so just real quickly, I have a, a paragraph about. So uh, Marion was the guy that actually was the printer and came up with the um, the plates that they used to press the books. And then I went down a rabbit hole about how they used to make paper in ancient times and all this stuff. So there's actually a link to all of that in on the website. Um, so while we have no textual record of Marion's thoughts about the etchings in the Lantifugians, we do know that Meyer was thinking about, the, about them in alchemical terms, punning the word Venus, the alchemical symbol for, symbol for copper. He writes in his preface that the pictures in his book are incised in Venus or copper, not without char charm or grace. Meyer's comment makes it clear, moreover, that in alchemical pursuit of purification and universal concepts, the sensory appeal of Marion's etchings, their charm and grace cannot be ignored. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, okay, let me go down to my notes here for emblem nine. Okay. Okay, so this one's called um, Of the Secrets of Nature. Um, shut up in the tree with the old man in the house of dew, and eating of the fruit thereof, he will become young. Um, and then below we have the Sophie have a tree with golden fruit, and an old senior of no mean repute, for which you must provide a house of glass, replete with dew therein some time to pass, that he, solacing nature with the fair, may shake off age and be as young men are. Um, so... For this reason, say the philosophers, the stone is first old, then it is white, then it is young, then it is red, because this is the color of youth as that of old age. It is added that the old man ought to be shut up within the tree, not in the open air, but in a house, not dry, but moist with dew. It is accounted a miracle for trees to spring or vegetate in a close place, but if it be moist, there is no doubt of their long duration. For the nutriment of the tree is moisture, an airy earth that is fat, which can ascend into the trunk and boughs, and, there, and they produce leaves, flowers, and fruit, in which natural work of all the elements do concur, fire giving the first motion as the efficient air, tenuity, and penetrability, water, um, it lubricates, the earth is coagulation, uh, for air, earth, uh, for air returns into water and water into earth, if any there are, superfluity ascend. By fire, I mean the natural heat, which being propagated with the seed, does by the power of the stars, as it were smith, lubricate, and form fruit like those things from whence the seed arises. But a dewy evaporation is not only good and expedient uh, to moisture, to moisten the tree, that it may more easily yield fruit, but also the old man, that be those fruits, he may become young again. That is to say, the dewy evaporation, mollifying, filling up, and restoring his wrinkled skin uh, and dry skin with temperature, heat, and moisture. For physicians do advisely and with great utility enjoin and prescribe warm baths in the marisma and age consumption. But if the thing can be well considered that the tree is. So all of these terms that they're talking about here, this all has to do with the alchemical process. Um, okay, so this made me think of the tree of knowledge or, you know, the tree of life, all of that stuff. So the tree of knowledge or the tree of philosophy is a metaphor presented by French philosopher uh, René Descartes in the preface to the French translation of the work Principles of Philosophy to describe the relations among the different parts of the philosophy in the shape of the tree. He describes knowledge as a tree. The tree's roots are metaphysics, its trunk, its physics, and its branches are all other sciences, the principle of which are medicine, mechanics, and morals. This uh, image is often assumed to show Descartes' break with the past and with the categorization of knowledge of the schools. Thus, all philosophy is like a tree, of which metaphysics is the root, physics is the trunk, and all the other sciences and branches grow out of this trunk, which are reduced to three principles, namely medicine, mechanics, and ethics. By the science of morals, I understand the highest and most perfect, which presupposing an entire knowledge of other sciences in the last degree of wisdom. 
So the tree of life is a fundamental archetype in many worlds, mythological, religious, and philosophical traditions. It's closely related to the concept of the sacred tree, uh, the tree of knowledge connecting to heaven and the underworld, such as Yggdrasil, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis, and the tree of life connecting all forms of creation, are forms of the world tree or the cosmic tree, and are portrayed in various religions and philosophies as the same tree. Uh, the tree can be seen as, the, seen as the feminine quality of creation and the man, the divine masculine. Uh, the building, it also has pillars. Um, so these are all about foundations or ladders of ascension. Uh, there's a crowned king at the top in the triangle that represents Kether on the tree of life and achieving a higher status leading to the divine or a bridge between heaven and earth as kings were seen in um, uh, as kings were seen as the middleman back then. Um, we have a dome as a roof, which is spherical or circle-shaped. So the meaning of that, the sphere, and it's is simple yet profound perfection, stands as a testament to the cosmic wholeness and unity, is a symbol of infinite possibilities, inherent balance, and complete harmony. From ancient civilizations to modern metaphysical properties of spheres, the sphere has maintained its position as a potent emblem of metaphysical properties. The alchemical processes, him being in a greenhouse of sorts, um, has to maintain a certain temperature, which is paramount in alchemy. Um, also, the correct moisture, um, like uh, the ration, the ration, oh my God, I'm losing my word, the word I'm trying to say. Um, you have to ration things. Basically, when you're making something, you have to have the ingredients perfect. If you're baking, you have to have the temperature perfect. Everything has to be just right. Uh, it's the same with physical alchemy, uh, which is also symbolic as well, but there is actual physical alchemy. So the building itself is a sacred geometric form. Uh, the tree branches at the top. The symbolism of branches in the tree spiritually speaks to a deep connection to the world around us, as well as our own beliefs, convictions, and thought patterns. Um, there's a triangle at the top of the dome. It's the alchemical symbol for fire. Uh, the triangle symbolizes um, and is often associated with Christianity and the three parts of the Holy Trinity, the God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The alchemical elements of fire, water, air, and earth are depicted with variations, upright and upside-down triangles. The Eye of Providence, uh, um, used as a religious symbol for God in the Renaissance period, it's commonly seen on the U.S. dollar bill. Um, in math, an equal, an equal, an equal lateral triangle is a triangle where all three angles are exactly 60 degrees. The shape is thought by some to represent perfection, and some Christians even treat the triangle as a symbol of God and a holy trinity. Um, some also associate triangles with the mind, body, and spirit, the beginning, middle, the end, birth, life, and death, past, present, and future. Um, so I think that's what's going on here in this one. Um, I like that they kind of have it in like a greenhouse type thing. So it's, you know, something that's baking or brewing or stewing or fermenting. You know, he's in there um, trying to gain his youth back through the Philosopher's Stone, basically. Um, I don't know if, Nick, I sent you that website um, where there's actually, I found online, a friend of mine uh, found an actual manual to making the Philosopher's Stone. And I read through it briefly. Um, and it's, uh, I'll have Nick put that link in the description below if you guys want to check that out. But there's an actual manual in existence that takes you the step-by-step -step process on how to make the Philosopher's Stone using urine. And it, it's like a nine month process that you go through and then you consume it um, and supposedly gain immortality. I thought that was pretty interesting. I went down that rabbit hole, you know, looking at the whole alchemy thing. But um, that's the info that I have for this one. Do uh, you guys have anything you want to add? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Yeah, um, just want to mention, too, I, uh, later this month, I'm actually doing a, uh, an episode on a friend's show, uh, The Interverse Podcast, and we're going to be talking about urine therapy. And that's something I've been interested in lately. Uh, urine therapy and its benefits and also urine symbolism too. So um, that's something I've been kind of thinking about as well. And I know that there's different alchemical, you know, um, sort of elixirs out there 
that uh, incorporate urine. It's a really, really fascinating, extraordinarily deep rabbit hole um, that I, I just am super interested in right now. My fiance too, Michelle, she's really interested in it. Um, but in my opinion, you know, what's going on here, I, I love a lot of what you mentioned for sure. I think the philosopher's stone in a lot of ways is a metaphor um, basically to attaining or getting closer to your highest self mm -hmm. and having a relationship with sort of your center and kind of your core, which connects you with all the realms above and below. And so um, I think that a lot of symbolism related to the philosopher's stone has to do with kind of going to the center of your wheel. Um, that's kind of the way I tend to look at it. And mm -hmm. what do you know, going within is part of what's being said here. Yes. With this illustration with this setup. So he's within actually a dwelling and the poem mentioned um, a house of glass. And to me, when I think of a house of glass, I think of the concept of the firmament. And so mm -hmm. the firmament is kind of viewed as sort of a, a crystalline, you know, sort of dome like structure that is sort of the barrier between this realm and the next realm, right? The, the realm of mm -hmm. spirit. And so the dome is the home. And so when you see structures like this, when you look at a mosque and there's a dome or you go to a cathedral and there's a large dome, the dome is symbolic of heaven. So what's yeah. been said for a very long time is that the sphere uh, is related to heaven and it's the cube or the square that's related to earth, right? So even in Freemasonry, you have the compass that's above that creates circles and that has that point of pivot. And then it's uh, the square that's down below, which makes right angles and straight lines, right? So yep. the dome is the home. The sphere represents the heavens. Um, and you see that here. And to me, when I see this tree, as you mentioned, uh, that is definitely, you know, emblematic of the world tree, which with the central axis in the middle of that dome. Any dome structure has a symbolic central axis, which could be likened to um, like a pillar or a post or a column. Also a plumb line too. You can mm -hmm. imagine a plumb line from the very middle top of the dome kind of going downward. It's actually not uncommon for some mosques to have a really beautiful chandelier coming down from the center of the dome. Some of the photos that I came across recently are really amazing. So when you see a dome like structure, just like all temples, by the way, and actually just like all buildings, it's a micro of the macro. So it's symbolic of the universe itself. So that tree is the world tree and he is uh, obviously picking fruit from it. He's about to eat one. I'm assuming these are apples, or, right? And so I'm assuming they're apples. Um, it's been said, you know, there's different philosophers. I'm pretty sure Pythagoras maybe was one. I could be wrong. Someone in the chat could correct me on that one. But uh, one of the things that they would do for their student is give them an apple and tell them to cut it in half and basically say, uh, study it, you know, that the secrets of the universe are right here. And so if you cut an apple in half, you're going to see a five-pointed star. The yeah. five-pointed star uh, is probably what this golden fruit represents because the five-pointed star, the pentacle or pentagram, encodes the golden spiral, the golden ratio. The number five is amazing. It's basically, um, to me, as a number, the number five is like a threshold between the lower numbers and higher numbers in a base 10 sequence. And so it's literally the barrier between the lower and the higher. It's a barrier between, um, I would say, in many ways, the material and the spiritual plane. And so even uh, in ancient Egypt, the duat, their other side, their sort of underworld, the symbol for the duat, the symbol for the entrance to the duat was a five-pointed star. And so the five-pointed star, obviously the fifth point, uh, the, the number five relates to spirit, the fifth element, right? And so... The apple itself also is a torus field. So if you cut it in half yeah. horizontally, you see the yeah. five-pointed star. But if you cut it in half vertically down the center, you see a torus field. There's a whole big weave with torus, the number five, the hierophant. The hierophant is always sitting between two pillars. He's actually sitting between two pillars as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he's doing in there. He is, uh, he is willing to consume this information. He's going within and he's being open. Notice too, this is something that I've seen in a lot of tarot cards now at this point. You'll uh, see it in a lot of older decks with the justice card. Notice that his legs are spread. That's very feminine, right? And so mm -hmm. his legs are spread because he's open to receive. Notice that his legs are actually exposed as well. Very, very feminine. So 
he's about to eat that apple. His mouth is also open. So his mouth is open. His legs are open, right? So he's about mm-hmm. to receive the wisdom from the world tree, essentially, um, to go and get closer to his sacred center, to his um, sort of core. And so that's what the world tree represents because that trunk represents the bridge or the axis between realms where everything revolves around. So uh, those are a few things off the top of my head that I kind of see with this card. Um, The little leg thing. Notice people's legs when they're sitting down, if they're spread or not. It actually says quite a bit. You know, uh, Mario, I just thought of it now because you pointed it out. Uh, If I noticed it, I may have wondered it myself, but I know we just mentioned shin before, but I mean, do you think even showing the legs like that could even be a way to be pointing at their shins? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Definitely. I mean, if you You look at them at the side, symbolism. (laughs) Yeah. Leg symbolism is really, really deep. Um, So there's a lot that could be conveyed with the leg. Also, I believe this is emblem nine, right? The ninth Mm -hmm. card in the major arcana is the hermit card going within isolation, you Mm -hmm. know, kind of going within a cave. This is a symbolic cave, basically. The hermit, he's always related to cave symbolism and going within, you know, uh, a metaphor for that is going into the cave. Absolutely. Yeah, I like, I definitely like the uh, hermit pointing that out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, I'm not going to go too much, like really too much into it, but I mean, for me with this and, you know, it could, it's also probably... Unfortunately, like due to seeing like um, buildings like this, I've seen them in Yale and just seen them in stuff that we covered on the occult rejects for eyeball stuff. Knowing what some of these places look like inside the dome, it does Mm. sometimes a lot look like kind of uh, the inside of an eyeball. And when I start looking at that and seeing the tree, I do wonder about like the vitreous nerves and if this has something to do with like part of the eyeball and the brain. Um. I do know, like, in some churches I have seen, depending on how the pillars are, in my opinion, and I, I think I sh- uh, people were mentioning it one time when I was, like, live out in Yale. I was just, like, walking around, and I stopped at a church and, um, like, kind of showed stuff that I thought was, like, eyeball symbolism. And then, like, there was, like, kind of, like, uh, brain stem shit, though. Like, I wasn't even noticing. That was, like, kind of obvious to somebody else. I don't know. That's what it looked like. So... Um, you know, with Catholic churches or depending on like what's going on inside, um, I have seen stuff that would also make me wonder eye and brain stuff. So I'm already medically even thinking that with this image. But uh, again, sure, sure. I just wonder if the inside that like that tree again could be like kind of like the hyaloid canal and then the vitreous nerves um, and stuff like that. Uh, I think that was great that you pointed out Shin because now I'm really wondering if that's uh, his his bare legs. If Shin is there, especially with the way he's bringing up his hand. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're almost like halfway to like, kind of like. Oh, yeah, sure. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. and you know, another thing that I had even thought when uh, Megan had mentioned, like, you know, the triangle at the top. Again, going into brain stuff, I know uh, you're kind of in the spot where a lot of people like to put up the triangle. You do have Amon's horn there, and the cellular structure is triangular in that part of your brain actually instead of other parts so i i even oh, wondered, interesting yeah i even wondered about that with uh again if it's pointing to any brain stuff you know who knows and that's it that's it out of me and then we'll nice. uh, move on to the next one and, uh, okay so emblem 21 oh yeah unfortunately lot, sorry I've you got, got you got yours back to you back <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> i've got a lot so buckle up okay so, a very common symbol in esoteric, the esoteric world. Um, so, it's called of the secrets of nature. Uh, make for the man and the woman circle. Of that a quadrangle. Of this a triangle. Of this the same circle. And you will have the philosopher's stone. Um, so, in this emblem, for instance, the philosopher holds the points of the enormous pair of dividers to a wall and traces a large circle around representations of a man and woman who have already been inscribed with smaller geometric shapes. So the emblem's motto taken from the Rosarium Philosophorum instructs the adept to a circle for the man and wife provide, which make quadrangle with equal side, that triangle. Oh, 
uh, trogonal, I guess I mispronounced that, resulting in a sphere, and this blessed stone to you will appear. So this one right off the bat reminded me of sacred geometry. Um, and so I'm kind of going to go down uh, mm. that a little bit. So it is a complex emblem in which the geometrical quest to square the circle is fused with the alchemical quest to transcend contraries, male and female, sulfur and mercury, spirit and matter. Uh, but for all of its preoccupation with the abstract domain of its mathematical ideas, Marion's picture insists upon representation as an embodied act, one that is in case is performed by a philosopher slash artist on a canvas of crumbling plaster and brick, the ostentatious materiality of which completes with the theoretical interest of the emblem's geometrical forms. Uh, in the quick and irregular hashes, dots, and scribbles of the etcher's needle, we encounter a powerful evocation of earthly decay that puts one in mind of the speaking ruins that Giovanni Battista Piranesi will later depict in his masterful etchings of ancient Rome. The wall's crumbling surface serves as a memento mori in the face of the philosopher's outsized confidence in geometry. And yet the wall goes uh, unremarked upon Meyer's motto, epigram and commentary instead it serves quietly as a kind of landscape a sensory background against the emblem of the foreground will be invested with meaning so it represents the ancient problem of squaring the circle uh, it is a mathematical example as a sustained commentary on the creation and transformation of knowledge uh, Meyer's viewpoint on this was that mathematics are a way to probe nature's secrets. This is a representation of sacred geometry, I believe, in the Fibonacci sequence that we talked about a little bit earlier. So sacred geometry ascribes symbolic and sacred meanings to certain geometric shapes and certain geometric proportions. It's associated with the belief of the divine creator of the universal geometer. The geometry used in the design and construction of religious structures, such as churches, temples, mosques, and mon monuments, altars, and tabernacles, has sometimes been considered sacred. The concept applies also to sacred spaces. Um, and then we have uh, the belief that a god created the universe according to the geometric plan has ancient origins. Plutarch attributed this belief to Plato, writing that Plato said God um, geometrizes Continual, continuously. In modern times, the mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss adapted this quote saying, God arithmetizes, which I found that was really interesting. Um, so uh, then it made me think of Johannes Kepler. Um, so he's believed in the geometric underpinnings of the cosmos. Harvard mathematician Xing Tung Yao expressed a belief in the centrality of geometry in 2010, quote, Lest one conclude that geometry is little more than a well-calibrated ruler, and this is no knock against the ruler, which happens to be a technology I admire, geometry is one of the main avenues available to us for probing the universe. Physics and cosmology have been, most by definition, absolutely crucial for making sense of the universe. Geometry's role in this may be less obvious, but it is equal, equally vital. I would go so far as to say that geometry is not uh, not only deserves a place at the table alongside physics and cosmology, but in many ways it is the table itself. Um, so the construction of medieval European cathedrals was often based on geometries intended to make the viewer see the world through mathematics and through this understanding gain a better understanding of the divine. Uh, so it was really common back then for people to use the Latin cross floor plan, uh, which is a form, another form of sacred geometry. Um, let's see, at the beginning of Renaissance in Europe, views shifted to favor simple and regular geometries. The circle in particular became a central and symbolic shape for the base of the buildings, as it is represented the perfection of nature and the centrality of man's place in the universe. The use of the circle and uh, and other simple and sy symmetrical geom geometric shapes was solidified as a staple of Renaissance sacred architecture. Um, and in Leon Battista Alberti's architectural treatise, which describes the ideal church in terms of spiritual geometry. So in the high middle ages, leading Christian philosophies explain the layout of the universe in terms of a microcosm analogy. 
Um, in her book, The Divine Visions, she witnessed Hildegard of Bingen explains that she saw an outstretched human figure located within a circular orb. When interpreted by theologians, the human figure was Christ and mankind uh, showing the earthly realm and the circumference of the circle was a representation of the universe. This is thought to later have inspired da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Uh, Dante uses circles to make up the nine layers of hell, categorized in his book, The Divine Comedy. Celestial spheres are also utilized to make up the nine layers of paradise. He further creates a cosmic order of circular forms that stretches from Jerusalem in the earthly realm up to God in heaven. This cosmology is believed to have been inspired by the ancient astronomer Ptolemy. Okay. So squaring the circle has been a mathematical problem that has been discussed for thousands of years. It is a problem that has never been solved and in the 19th century was proven to be impossible to do. Uh, the square circle has been a popular theme in occult and alchemy for centuries and is still an important symbol within it. The square represents the physical world because it represents the four elements, the four cardinal directions, the four season, seasons, etc. The circle represents the spirit because it's infinite and it goes out in all directions. The triangle represents the un union of body, mind, and spirit. The circle in the center represents the individual spirit, whereas the outer circle represents the greater spirit of the creator, which encompasses all things. It starts off with spirit, and it ends with spirit. In the modern scientific world, there's also a squared circle in the form of four forces of nature, which are the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and gravity. The four forces govern the activity of the universe. The circle of the square of forces are all of the cycles, vibrations, and frequencies and oscillations that everything from particles to planets, star systems, all the way up to galaxies and beyond are subject as well. As explained in the page of the Axis of the Universe, in many occult and witchcraft rituals, a circle is cast but is, on, but is also then squared. Magic rituals are performed in a circle with a practitioner visualizing a circle or a sphere of energy emerging out of the center and creating a magic space of power. The altar itself is in the center where the tools to perform the magical operations are and the higher realms are accessed through the center of the magic circle. There is a paradoxical thing in magic where the circle is squared when the magician calls forth the spirits from the four corners each one representing one of the four elements and the earth to participate in this ritual. The four elements come together in the center of the squared circle to become the fifth element, and that's its totality. This is a doorway to higher realms. It is created by creating a sing singularity of the physical world. Okay, so now I'm going to get into um, the actual emblem itself here a little bit. So the wall, to me, represents impermanence because um, it is decaying. It has to be upkept. That's with any spiritual practice. You have to maintain your practice. Um, and then the death, if you will, it represents the death and the degradation of foundation that needs to be upkept. It also represents the great work, as we call in the cult, and harkens to Freemasonry as well. Um, the paper on the ground, so initially I thought it was a circle because we have a hexagram there, a square, and then I got to looking closer and I magnified it. It's actually an octahedron. Um, so um, it's got, so the circle itself represents limitless things among um, them, eternity, unity, monotheism, infinity, and wholeness. So the octahedron represents balance, harmony, and alignment. It has a rich history dating back to ancient civilizations such as the Greeks, Egyptians, and Mayans. These cultures revered the octahedron for its symmetry and balance, often incorporating it in their architecture and religious practices. The Egyptians used it in spiritual rituals and ceremonies, and the Mayans used it in their calendar systems and temple designs. Uh, in various esoteric practices, it holds deep symbolic meaning. It's associated with the element of air, representing communication, intellect, and higher levels of consciousness. Um, it represents the integration of the opposite, such as light and dark, masculine and feminine. Um, the square itself represents um, equality, sturdiness, reliability. The square is the perfect balance between four points, and nature is 
full of sets of four that complete and depend on one another. So the overall impression of the square is one of the stability and dependence. Um, it is the base for the pyramid and the shape you use to construct the center of a circle. Uh, so we got the four cardinal directions, the four elements, four seasons, four uh, uh, cosmic elements, suns, moons, planets, stars, and the four fa phases of life, which is birth, childhood, adulthood, and old age. Um, the hexagram represents the union of the four classical elements and the union of the divine masculine and feminine. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but here lately in the spiritual community, there's like, it's becoming really trendy. Um, and a friend, friend of mine, we were talking about how we, in our society today, we lack the feminine principle and we lack the divine feminine and how we need to integrate that more to kind of get things going back in the direction that they need to because we live in such a masculine um, world and environment right now. Um, and I've just noticed a lot. A lot of uh, every everywhere I look on the internet, now they're talking about the integration of the divine masculine, the divine feminine. It's it's becoming um, you know pretty common to see. As soon as I I open up the apps, that's all I'm seeing right now. So that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, so the last part here, guys, and I'll uh, I'll let Mario take over. So it symbolizes the intricate balance and unity of opposing forces, serving as a key to unlocking spiritual truths and cause cosmic wisdom it encapsulates the integration of the divine with the earthly and the masculine with the feminine and the spiritual with the material showcasing the underlying unity that permeates the cosmos in ancient mesopotamia the six-pointed star was associated with celestial phenomena and was often used in astronomical and astrological contexts for example it was used to represent the planet saturn and babylonian seals and amulets the ancient egyptians also incorporated the hexagram and their architecture and art, using it as a symbol of harmony and balance. It can be found in the designs of some Egyptian temples where it was believed to represent the perfect union of the divine masculine and feminine. Um, in Western esoteric traditions, the hexagram embodies the hermetic principle of as above, so below, signifying the harmony between the macro and the microcosm uh, and the heavens and the earth. It's a symbol of alchemical transformation, representing the blending of opposing elements into a unified whole. Um, so this one, again, reminds me of analysis of the keyword and um, the Rose Cross ritual. And, you know, the whole process of your practice is an alchemical, you know, uh, process that you go through. Um Anytime you're practicing anything in the cult world or esoteric world, when you get to, you know, the higher levels, you're going to start learning about alchemy and, and, you know, basically cleaning your soul over and over and over again so that you can receive the divine and become whole once again. Um, also, I think um, another concept is basically we come down here, we're incarnated, we come down and then we pair up you know, as male and females, because we are separated from the divine. And so we try to link up and pair ourselves up so that we can integrate both divine masculine and feminine to become whole here on earth so that we can transcend and attain enlightenment as well. So that's um, what this means for me, basically. Then we have the uh, classic Christian cross, but it was, you know, it didn't originate in Christianity. It was a symbol that represents the four elements um, also, I noticed uh, on his clothing, it kind of reminds me of a ladder. Mm. Um, the way that the the stitching is done, he's got it on, you know, uh, the two arm pieces that are coming <laughs> down. So, and then you have the his hat on top, which is another dome. He's trying to reach enlightenment by climbing up this ladder and try to figure out, you know, how we can make this work so that, you know, to gain enlightenment. I, I thought this one was uh, super interesting. And, and I, I really liked researching this one quite a bit. I'm sure Mario's got quite a few things to say about this as well. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great point with the ladder. That makes sense too, for a few different reasons. <clears throat> you know, I really see this figure here as he is that sort of grand architect sort of mm -hmm. person, right? So he's almost yeah. kind of like um, mirroring um, the sort of uh, perspective or position of God. And so he's actually, he has a higher vantage point because he is actually making a compass right now. The compass mm -hmm. that makes a circle, right? So once again, yeah. the compass relates to heaven, the square relates to earth. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so he actually is the point of pivot with the compass. My personal opinion is when you see the compass itself, like on the Freemasonic emblem, that the point yeah. of pivot sometimes has an eye in it. And yep. uh, I see this point of pivot as basically the pole star. That's the point of pivot yeah. in the heavens, essentially. So he has a northern position symbolically. His right arm is actually the axis. You refer to the axis of the universe. Mm-hmm. So that's what the middle part is where you pivot around to create the circle. That yes. is the axis. His left hand is actually, in my opinion, they're alluding to the fact that he's actually going counterclockwise. You know, and mm-hmm. that's actually more of a left hand path sort of thing. And wouldn't you know mm-hmm. that pole is in his left hand. And so yep. counterclockwise is actually more of a feminine polar dynamic because it actually um, goes within. It goes to the center. Uh, clockwise rotation is actually more expansive. It's more solar. So it's more projective and more masculine. <clears throat> and so depending uh, rotation is such a big thing. It's like in rituals, if you rotate around a central totem, mm-hmm. if you go clockwise or counterclockwise, that means something different, basically. Yep. So there is more of a counterclockwise rotation, in my opinion, that I'm kind of picking up. The other thing that I'm picking up, too, that I think is really interesting is the fact that he's exposing his leg once again. Uh, mm-hmm. I've gotten into leg symbolism in other presentations and videos. But your leg also represents just one leg, highlighting one leg. And notice that he actually is kind of on his tippy toes. That's another thing. You will see Hermes, Mercury on his tippy toes because it represents what? A point of pivot, right? And so we have, he is basically what's sometimes referred to as the unmoved mover. He's in the middle of the wheel, the point of pivot in the wheel, the axle of the wheel, the axis of the universe. And so Mm -hmm. his right leg is indicating a a stationary point of pivot, his right arm, because it's in the middle of the circle, it's in the middle of the circumpunct, which is also the Godhead, is the Mm -hmm. point of pivot as well. And so there's a few things going on there um, that are very, very interesting. You know, he's very much uh, this mercurial sort of figure, I think, in a bunch of Mm -hmm. different ways. Um, But this image to me also reminds me quite a bit of the sun card. And so yes. on the sun card, you will usually see two children and sometimes they're holding hands. Sometimes there's a ribbon between them or you will see a man and a woman. And what's behind them? A brick wall. Right. And so for a long time, this kind of eluded me. What's up with brick wall symbolism? What's the deal? And then I learned in this fantastic book called Babylonian Star Lore. <clears throat> I've shouted it out a number of times over the years. But basically what he says is that during Gemini season in ancient Babylon, they refer to that time of year as the brick mold, because this is when they would resume baking Mm -hmm. bricks outside. And this is when Mm -hmm. they would resume building projects using bricks. And so Gemini corresponds with brick making. It's really interesting. We were talking about Romulus and Remus. What are they known for? They are known for being the founders of Rome. This is where we get Rome from is from Romulus. Mm -hmm. And they built the first brick wall in Rome, this foundational wall. This is where Romulus actually killed Remus as well, is at this exact same brick wall. And so this brick Gemini symbolism is fascinating. Nick, if you ever want to talk about this sometime, I'm down. But the George Floyd incident happened during Gemini season. And there's a ton of brick symbolism (laughs) and twin symbolism with with his storyline. Yo, I swear to God, real quick, before when you were were talking about those legs being exposed, I was even going to say, as crazy as it is, I even think (coughs) that that part of the cop using that area of his body on him... I mean, I can't breathe, shin. I mean, I know it's not his shin, but very close. It's just, to me, I was like, yo, I think that's all included in that that masterpiece we were handed. Oh, yeah, dude. There's a whole, I have a whole page of notes just about the Gemini brick to, symbolism. You know, yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. Awesome. Um, and then Mercury, I said this guy is a mercurial magical figure. Mercury rules Gemini. So Gemini symbolism isn't just about twins. It's about all partnerships. It's about all relationships, including the relationship you have with self. I think that's maybe perhaps Mm -hmm. one of the most important things. So to me, it's really interesting that there's a brick wall here. There's a couple on the brick wall. Um, A couple of small things I just want to point out too is notice that the plaster is still intact uh, within their sphere and within their square. 
but yet mm-hmm. it's peeling sort of everywhere else, right? So there's kind yep. of a completion sort of dynamic there that's yep. very deliberate and very intentional, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I also think it's interesting too, that the triangle doesn't touch the top of that circle as well. Mm-hmm. The, the two lower points, uh, touch the circle, but the upper point <laughs> does not. Yeah, exactly. Right. 100%. That's part of it. Yeah, dude, it, it goes <laughs> on and on and on and on. <laughs> Yo, that is bugged out. We got to talk about that. Uh, for sure. Future, for sure. For sure. So, um, that is wild. so there you go, you know, the circumpunct and Godhead symbolism spheres within spheres. There's a lot to be said about that. But when you think of spheres within spheres, they all share a same central point. They share a central axis, which again, you refer to as the axis of the universe, which is exactly mm-hmm. what it is. Whatever book you got that from, by the way, I want to read more about that <laughs> because that's my jam, you know? So that's kind of what that point of pivot, his right arm with that stick represents. That's what the compass, when you plant it down symbolically, that is the axis of the universe. That is the axle of the wheel of heaven. And then you are revolving around it. Yeah, okay. yep. absolutely. I like it. Um, that actually makes what I was kind of even contemplating even adding. Um, but you actually <laughs> kind of helped mine look a little bit more like understandable. Um, first, I, I saw that on the bottom, I do see, in my opinion, I saw eight, six, and four, which I've said over and over again, I think is um, Tahuti or Mercury, you know, whatever that path that mm-hmm. they take that's the, represents them. So I did think like that was possibly kind of like Toth, Tahuti, Mercury, like, you know, you were saying. Or the magician, even the magician is there. And, you know, I, I what I was seeing at it first, I just want to say those things hanging off of him, that design kind of hanging off the back of his arm, the little, like little frilly stuff and even the stuff going down his leg. My opinion, that does start to look like when you start going actually into like going up into the brain, your actual optic nerves, not inside your eyeball now, inside your head does look very much like that. Um, I don't know if that's it, but um, I did see, like, in my opinion, you mentioned the axle, and I was like, oh, that's a great way to, to use it, because sometimes I forget that I use that myself. Um, I think, because of my own experience as well with magic, I do think that he's actually showing the axle, but yoked and unyoked. Um, I've said that my pupil will get big and one will get small when I fuck with magic. So I think you have the big one and you have the small one here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only way that's going to happen is if you actually kind of change the way the axle would normally be going, you're going to have to unyoke it. You Mm -hmm. know, one's going to go the other way. The other one's going to go out there, you know? Um, And I I do think even other symbolism kind of with like Tahuti or or Toth or Mercury with Hode, um, you will have the hermaphrodite there. Um, That is both energies brought together then down here in this one, you actually will see them fully separated in the smaller mm-hmm. one. So I think maybe that's even something to take into consideration. Definitely. <laughs> and Mercury being related to the divine androgyne, being masculine and feminine, knowing how to receive and then also project light and dark. Mercury itself, mm-hmm. right, being a liquid and a metal, you know. So, yeah, yeah, it's all related. Yeah. yeah. And just like to mention real quick, like our eyeballs are yoked. Maybe for people who don't understand that. So like if one pupil gets get small, the other one's going to get small. The other one gets big. The other one does. But if you unyoke them, you know, if they're not yoked, one will go small and one can go big. Just like kind of, um, you know, what you're seeing here, I think possibly, you know, or that would even be, in my opinion, the n- number eight is if you took mm-hmm. a continuous loop and twisted it now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you'll get the same okay. thing. You'll get you'll get those wheels will both go in different directions now. Yeah. You know. So yeah, that's what I got out of this. Nice. We'll move on to the next <clears throat> one. There we go. And uh yeah. This oh yeah, this is the one we're both doing, right, Mario? Yes, correct. Yeah, did you want us to go first or do you want me to go? Doesn't make a difference to me. Whatever works. Maybe if you want to read this here and then I'll go. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, go. sure. Uh, cool. Emblem 25 uh, of the secrets of nature. Uh, the dragon dies not except he be killed by his brother and sister, which are Sol and Luna. Uh, epigram 25. To kill the dragon will, will much art require. So sure as never after to respire. Brother and sister jointly must invade. His life, because nothing else can him degrade. Luna, his sister, is who Orion slew. His brother, 
Phoebus Python overthrow. And uh, excellent. Yeah, we'll go back to that, and I'll pull nice. it up in a different. Pull up a little bit bigger for you. Yeah, but if you wanted to go, uh, you sure, should. sure. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah, I love this one. This is the one that got me the most excited when you first <laughs> awesome. sent over. I knew, one. I knew it. As soon as I really? seen it, I was like, "This is Mario's." Yes. Nice. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the d- dragon dies not right, except he be killed by his brother and sister, the sun and the moon. And so it, this is really interesting because I've seen a number of illustrations like this, where it is a man. That's clearly indicative of the sun and a woman clearly indicative of the moon. And they are together defeating, um, in this case, it's a dragon. But I've seen other versions where they are basically um, trying to defeat Mercury as well. Different versions of Mercury. And so that's really interesting. How does Mercury relate to the dragon? What is symbolically sort of going on here? And from my perspective, the reason why I geek out on all this stuff and the reason why this one really caught my eye (coughs) is because this plays into my understanding of the symbolic ages. And so a lot of people have different opinions about the great sort of ages of time, right? Uh, The different yuga cycles, what sort of... um, a sign we might be in, how long that lasts, when the age of Aquarius is coming, when these different cycles come to ends. You know, different cultures had different opinions about all of that. My personal opinion, I'm tracking sort of a different system, and it's really just one big, large shift, one big, large transfer. And that is from polar to solar. And there is an intermediate sort of age that would be lunar based. And with each of these ages comes a different sky clock. And so today, most people's sky clock has to do with astrology, whether you're tropical or sidereal or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about that, you're actually really talking about a solar based system. And so you're talking about the path of the sun. You're talking about the ecliptic. So all of the constellations are along the path of the sun. Um, And then there's debate whether or not there is a 13th sign. A lot of people think it's a fucus, if that's such a thing, which actually could totally be a conversation with this piece as well, because he's the serpent bearer. Mm -hmm. But these three different ages or this great progression from polar to solar is really fascinating. When it was the polar age, this is more primordial. Uh, arguably it was much more feminine. There was a reverence for the feminine, for the goddess. It was way more earth centric. So it wasn't Mm. heliocentric. It wasn't sun based. It was geocentric. It was more earth based. And the sky clock during the polar age was actually the Northern sky. So it was Ursa major and Ursa minor. And also a very important Northern constellation is Draco, the dragon. So mm-hmm. all three of these constellations go counterclockwise around the pole star. The pole star being the point of pivot in the heavens. Um, and this point of pivot, this big axle has been referred to as the world axis or the axis of the universe, the axle of the wheel of heaven. <coughs> and so primordial man was more concerned, I'm convinced, with the northern sky. That was their sky clock. I've read from several different authors at this point that what happened was when man became more solar, the sky clock shifted to the path of the sun. And so even this guy named John Major Jenkins, he wrote a book called Galactic Alignment. And he basically says that the ancient Chinese people, according to his research, they had eight constellations in the northern sky. He said around 5,000 years ago, one per trigram in the I Ching, by the way. And he said when they became solar, they shifted those eight constellations to the path of the uh, uh, sun, the ecliptic, and then they added four more constellations, giving them 12 total constellations. I'm pretty convinced that's exactly what happened in Western astrology as well. It's the same sort of Mm -hmm. dynamic. And so the original seven stars of enlightenment, in my opinion, go back to the northern sky. There's a lot of deities who are actually more polar and northern in nature, and Mercury is one of them. Mercury is a polar deity. He goes between realms. He's the messenger of the god, and he goes between realms via this central bridge or central axis that connects all spheres of reality, connects all of the different realms above and below basically together. The Norse equivalent of this 
I've heard from several people at this point is that I can't remember its name, but there's a squirrel that goes up and down the world tree. It's the same sort of idea. Mercury has that caduceus. When you see twin serpents going up the caduceus or you see a serpent going up the tree, they are going up the world axis. They are going up the axis of the cosmos itself. It's really interesting when you're talking about mercurial symbolism, you you know, he's really related to the phallus. He's related to the column or the post. He's related to the tree. He's also related to the club, which you see here that these two people are using to try and defeat the dragon. <coughs> he's also related to the arrow. Crowley in his book of Thoth, I believe it's under his temperance entry. He says the arrow is one of, I think he said purest glyphs of mercury. So anything phallic, anything penetrative, that is definitely Mercury like all day long. So the arrow itself is related to Mercury. I would say the bow is more feminine, actually. Just think of like the crescent moon and think of the fact that uh, the archer holds onto the bow, but it's the arrow that leaves. It's the arrow that travels and goes to, uh, you know, whatever it is you're aiming at. So the dragon doesn't die, but it's interesting. People's perceptive on uh, perception on sort of the center of everything has changed that has shifted and it's shifted to a more lunar and solar understanding of things. So the dragon here, in my opinion, symbolic of Draco in the Northern sky, symbolic of the serpents around the world tree, things like that. And they are defeating him. And so basically it's almost like the new age conquering the old age and this is something that you will see in a lot of artwork is the transition of ages, the transition of time. Mm -hmm. So this is actually what you're seeing. You're seeing the transition of time from this older, more primordial understanding of things. There you go. To a newer understanding of things, which is more lunar and more solar sort of in nature. Um, and so polar symbolism, primordial symbolism actually predates uh, sun and moon. And so even if you look at like the um, scales of Libra, right, you usually you can or if you look at the Kabbalistic tree of life, you have those two pillars, right? The left pillar and the right pillar. One is lunar, one is solar, but there's a central pillar, right? When you look at the scales, you have one pan. They're being weighed against the other light and dark, black and white, uh, lunar, solar. But you have the central axis of the of the scale itself that allows them to be weighed against each other. And so um, so really polar and lunar, in my opinion, you know, um, those aren't just the only two sort of things going on when you break down what's going on here. There's a third quality and that third quality is actually polar in nature. And the dragon has been used as a polar symbol and the serpent has been used as a polar symbol for a very long time. And so that's pretty much what I see here is the modern people defeating older sort of an older understanding of things. So we're seeing the passage of time essentially is how I personally uh, kind of perceive this one. That was awesome. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just say too, this fits in line with a lot of other illustrations of dragon slaying you will see that dragon slayers will often have a very long sword or a very long spear. It's symbolic of that axis, you know? So uh, St. George is a really good example of this. Uh, you'll sometimes see Mary with a really long uh, cross. The, the bottom of the cross is super, super long, and she's actually killing some sort of serpent or whatever. That serpent or dragon, which there's feminine symbolism related to the dragon as well. In fact, I've seen older alchemical illustrations where it'll be an old dragon, but she has breasts, mm -hmm. you know, so this relates to the primordial mother. Um, so my opinion, too, is that these dragons are, might be feminine, actually, that that that's kind of like the symbolic association. But it's primordial feminism or uh, primordial, uh, the primordial mother, the dark mother. And things like that, uh, which a lot of people have just a complete aversion to. But to me, in the occult world, it's like a lot of symbolism actually uh, goes back to sort of this understanding of things. Yes. People are afraid of it. They don't want to acknowledge it, you know. Like so it. it's all things hidden. Very well said, Mario. It's always really right good. on. Yeah. Well, go for it, man. What, what do you think about this one? <laughs> um, This one, again, I took from like looking at a... Uh, 
really be going more into the eyes and stuff. But I, I do want to say, I, I do think, um, kind of almost going along with the primordial uh, feminine aspect, uh, I, I do think sometimes when it comes to dragons, um, that could even be like down to blood symbolism, which I think, like for me, that would fit exactly what you were saying in my, to me. You mm. know, because like that's still kind of like a, uh, uh, it's a, a like a vehicle for something that's in form. You know what I'm saying? It's like kind of like a, a, a liquid put into form. So I see that to be very basic feminine uh, feminine thing in itself. It's hard to explain, but I, I see what yeah. you're getting at with that. I could see that with blood. Um, I don't think I'm getting into blood on my end. Again, like I said, I do think uh, I'm kind of looking at it more from the eyes. Um, we'll get into it. In this, um, you know, I, I again, because of even covering... Um, Covering it on the show uh, about a year ago or over a year ago now. Um, I always remembered saying like I thought that you could possibly see kind of like the sun and the moon in your eyes kind of a little bit. Um, you know, you got this dark spot and then you got this, you know, the shiny one here. You know, it could just be coincidence. It really may not have to do with this. But I, I did wonder if maybe that was even kind of what we're seeing here on the left side. Uh, one And, you know, the one thing that I, I did want to uh, show too... I don't know if snakes or dragons, um, I could be wrong, but I do wonder if sometimes that bending and twisting stuff can even represent, um, once the pupil starts to change, depending if it's getting big or small, the hyaloid canal will change. You know, it'll either be straight or it'll be pulled back a little bit and it starts to bend. So I have wondered if snakes and, uh, you know, dragons and stuff like that could be referencing that, possibly. Mm. It could um, make sense to me. These bows, you know, these bow people, I find it, I find this interesting too, because, you know, and again, like I, I would probably normally wouldn't have brought this up, but I knew that inside your cornea, there is a bowman's lair. So like that just like you know, throws me nice. off when I see like a bowman or a guy, you know, a man with a bow. Um, and like here where your lens is, um, when you start getting into like the zonules of Zin, um, they very much almost kind of look like. Like like things of like almost like Spider Man webs or uh, like kind of like uh, like wheat or uh, lavender, but like with very long stems and it's almost like very stringy like so so the lens can move and bend when the pupil changes. So like it even very much like makes me think of like how like you can even pull like the bow in a sense. There's a less you know the elastic sense to it to move, which is supposed to happen. I mean, then if you even look at it here with the hyaloid, the hyaloid canal going into the optic nerve, I mean, now it even looks like the whole arrow as well. Um, so I was just wondering if, you know, maybe that's what we're seeing there with these bow people. Very um, interesting. I love that. And, yeah. you know, and then when you start getting into like kind of twins or you're seeing doubles here, well, you have two eyes as well. You know, I meant to say that even before with like, you know, the idea of twins, you're going to have two eyeballs. Well, for the most right. part. Um, here's a little bit about what I was getting at too with those types of domes again. These are some examples of what I've seen on the inside of them. Um, mm -hmm. and inside of the eye, some of them, I wonder if it's like, you know, it could be the pupil. Um, who knows, but that was just a little bit of example. And I caught that in the background, made me think oh, of yeah. that again. It's all related, man, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I even thought just interesting because you're seeing like wooden staffs. I just did want to at least make somewhat of a... A reference to this, and instead of a dragon, you do have a snake on the ground, mm -hmm. but the hermit card, you are getting a guy with a wooden staff, and you do have one snake on the bottom and then one on top of the staff, and you do have two type of snake dragon things on this side. So mm -hmm. I did see kind of a correlation there, and I just did want to bring that up, at least make a, you know, point that out. Uh, in the discourse for this emblem, M.M. writes, in acquiring the golden fleece, the dragon was first of all to be killed because the labor being attempted by many men, they were overcome by the dragon and destroyed with deadly poison. The reason was because they were not sufficiently armed against the dragon's poison, nor instructed by what intrigue he might be slain. But Jason, the physician, neglected no manner of remedies whereof he received several from Medea, who's <laughs> interesting name, uh, the advice of the mind, uh, and amongst those the images of Sol and Luna, which using he successfully obtained the victory with the reward, that is the golden fleece. Um, golden fleece in simple gematria equals 93. 
um, mm-hmm. and 90s. Of course it does. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and that <laughs> matches, which I do find interesting because, again, I said I thought it was like very kind of like twig-like. Um, I have actually wondered if Twin Peaks, in a sense, when they're showing the trees constantly going down the streets or the trees, depending on how you're looking at your zonules of Zin, if it's under an electron mag- microscope, it almost starts to kind of look like Christmas trees, in a sense, with like snow on them, like uh, stacks of trees. It's hard to explain. You'd have to Google it and see it, but you'd see what I'm talking about. Or it almost looks like lavender with the little balls on it. Um, Zaniel does match that. And again, like I have said, I, I've, I've kind of wondered about wood, you know, or twigs or certain things like that. And I'm like wondering, is that why they got those clubs in their hand? Maybe that matches. Um, Zaniel, you know, Fifth Degree, Golden Child, Moon Child, which is a book by Crowley and a song by Iron Maiden. Uh, Somatics. Dragon and Simple Gematria. <laughs> I find this interesting. Equals Jason, even though we just mentioned Jason the Physician. Uh, tent. Um, Merkaba, Chokma, Koran, Coven, Cipher, Tiger, Slave, and Anchor. Um, the interesting thing with this is that with uh, Dragon, and it meant mentioning Tent and Anchor, in my opinion, um, the optic <clears throat> nerve as you're going into it, can be symbolized by a tent. Uh, that's just my opinion. And I think an anchor actually kind of like really shows that like you're kind of like stuck here, you're grounded. So in my opinion, I do find it interesting, like if you're thinking of kind of the hyaloid canal as being that dragon, it is going all the way back from that tent from the optic nerve, basically to the front of the eyeball, which you can kind of start to look at like possibly like as an anchor. I mean, if you want to start mm-hmm. playing with it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know. Just weird stuff that started popping up into my head when I ran those numbers. I figured I'd include it. Um, also matches uh, Sagittarius and Simple Gematria equals 114, and that matches Twin Dragons, Ra Horkweet, Scientology, Easter Bunny, uh, Scarlet Woman, Mark of the Beast, and King Solomon. Interesting. Yes. Nice. Actually, uh, do you mind just going back to one of the... Sure. Um, there you go couple things i'd like to add as i'm thinking about things and as you're (laughs) bringing things up and whatever again i I really love this one um just to be clear because i know this is a concept that i've talked about many times and not everyone um has an understanding of it but it is so important um that i keep on repeating myself uh with it because it really unlocks a whole new layer of symbolism uh northern symbolism polar symbolism primordial uh what some people refer to as the primordial tradition Um, you see this in the tarot, you have the star card, moon card, and sun card. These are emblematic of those three different ages. The star is the North star. It's usually surrounded by seven stars. This would be Ursa major, the original seven stars of enlightenment, where even like in the Vedic tradition, that's where their sages come from. They come from the North. They, uh, they clearly deliberately plainly say that they come from Ursa major itself. Then you have the moon card and then you have the sun card. These are three different ages. In Freemasonry, in some of these tracing boards, you have three different pillars. And it's really fascinating that these three pillars sometimes will be, uh, there will be one in the foreground, one in the midground, and then one in the background. I've seen it where the one in the foreground is solar, the one in the midground is lunar, the one in the background is what I refer to as polar or also stellar. This is because back then the the, uh, fixed stars were more important than the wandering stars. Right. And some people have even speculated that this may have even been the time before we actually even had a moon. So there what maybe wasn't even an opportunity for lunar worship yet. Um, And so to me, that's indicative of the solar age is closest to our present day. This is what most people I think are kind of preoccupied with personally, Mm -hmm. preceded Mm -hmm. by a lunar age, which was also used as a sky clock. And then uh, before that was this stellar polar sort of uh, dynamic. But to me, it's sort of right there in the tarot. Uh, Also, Mercury relating to this dragon, too. Again, they're related to the divine androgyne. So they're the synthesis of that. And here, though, we clearly have man and woman at odds with sort of uh, what I refer to as more mercurial sort of energy, you know. Um, Also, I, I just noticed that in the background, it looks like there's a guy like tr- fleeing from the waters. Mm-hmm. You yes, know? yes. Be- I wondered about that. 
So he's in panic. He's leaving the depths. He's leaving the sort of uh, the feminine waters. He's yes. leaving the place where things are hidden and murky and mysterious and things like that, which is what this dragon represents. And also when you see dragons or you see serpents, um, even like uh, different variations of the Capricorn glyph and even Capricorn itself, like the illustration of Capricorn, the sea goats, this is a feminine goat, by the way, not a masculine goat. Um, Saturn, before it was viewed as a uh, masculine old man, it was more of a crone-like energy. It's actually more of the sacred divine feminine. I did a couple of presentations called The Lost Lore of Saturn uh, that was all about this. When you see the curly cue sort of in its tail, and then you see sort of the barb at the end, when you see it kind of wrapping around like that, this is basically just emblematic of like the generative principle. It's like life itself. It's the curves of life, basically the spiral, right? And then someone in the chat said that, uh, that dragons with wings are, are considered to be sometimes feminine and dragons without wings are, are more masculine. So I'm inclined to think that we're talking about this primordial dark mother, dragon mother sort of archetype which modern man in this instance, again, they're at odds with. They want things to be black and white. They want things to be sooner, uh, solar, lunar, and they're mm -hmm. not having sort of this more ancient kind of wisdom. So that's all I have for this one. Very nice. Thank you. <coughs> okay. All right. And uh, we're on to this one. The last one, actually, right? Correct. I believe so, yeah. Slide this is the other one that I had. Look at that. What's the odds yeah. I, st I stopped on 17 slides? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All right, so um, of the secrets of nature, two eagles come together, one from the east, the other from the west. And then the epigram is, Great Jove, uh, I think it maybe sent, oh no, Great Jove, two eagles out of Delphi sent to the east and western parts, for this intent that he the middle of the earth might find, which they're returning, well resolved his mind. But those two eagles are two stones, which have one from the east and the other from the west. So I thought this was really, really interesting. And as soon as I saw, I knew what it was referencing. And uh, basically, this is Jupiter. This is Zeus, basically, right? The king of the planets. And he was interested in researching um, where the center of the world was. And there's two variations on this mythology. One is that what they say here is that um, two eagles come together, one from the east, the other from the west. So the idea was that two eagles from the extremities of the east and west came together, and he figured where they cross over or where they meet would be the center of the world. <coughs> the other variation on this is that two eagles left Zeus and then uh, they went around the world and then where they met again, that would be sort of the center of earth. So this is really interesting because um, one of my threads that I've been following for a very long time now is this idea of the center of the earth, which is sometimes referred to as the navel of the earth. And so the Omphalo stone, meaning navel, it indicated sort of the sacred center uh, of their people. And I think this is a very healthy attitude for people around the world to have, actually, is to have their sacred center. Oftentimes, it's kind of marked with either like a some sort of totem. It might be a stone, like the Omphalo stone uh, in Mecca. It's a Kaaba cube. Um, there's other places uh, in Jerusalem. There's even the, the Dome of the Rock. What's within the Dome of the Rock? There's literally a rock, <laughs> okay? A big slab of stone, and there's even a hole in it. That's not uncommon as well. Um, sometimes it's like a tree, like a world tree, or like a standing stone or something along these lines. But people all over the world have this idea that they have a sacred center and that this is sort of their holy of holies, and this is actually their pilgrimage location if they actually leave and move from their original sort of uh, area. And so this is what all pilgrimage locations basically are, is you're going to your people's most sacred site, you know, whether it's in Jerusalem, Mecca, whatever. And so the, and they exist all over the world. Um, but what this is really indicating to me is what uh, Rene Ganon refers to as a secondary uh, location from the actual true real center of things. And so in my opinion, I'm all about sort of trying to understand uh, the center of the cosmos, the center of earth, 
the whole thing about it is that in my cosmology, um, there is once again, this axis that is in the center of all realms above and below. And you actually on a more like astral sort of level, you can access this axis or bridge to other realms by going to your center. That's how it's done by going to the still place within. And so going to the center of your wheel, you can access the center of the great wheel basically is how it works because everything is modeled off of this original pattern, which is very much like a Taurus field basically. And I think on earth it's kind of been coded that the North is sort of a sacred center on earth. And there's all of this, you know, sort of lore and mythology and different texts and stuff that suggests that humanity was actually hyperborean. Humanity came from the north. This is where the Garden of Eden was. This is where paradise was. This is um, when there was paradise times and things like that. And so there was a migration away from the north. Symbolically, it could be literal. I don't really know, but I think it's really intriguing because it fits with this idea that everything expands from the center which is to say everything expands from source, but then also returns to source as well. Once again, not unlike a Taurus field. And the middle of the Taurus field would be the hyperbola, which is basically the axis or the trunk of um, the world tree. And so it's really interesting. Kings of old had this idea that they want to rule from the center of their land, from the center of their domain. And from there, all four directions emanate north, south, east, and west, but they occupy the central location, that central spot. This is why a lot of kings and emperors are actually associated with the cross and also the number four. The emperor card is the fourth card in the major arcana. I did a stream called uh, Kingdoms, Kings, and Crosses, and I get into this whole entire dynamic. It's actually really interesting. Um, Rene Ganon, who I just referred to, he has a book called Symbolism of the Cross, and he gets into this whole entire dynamic. Metaphysically, why kings associate with the cross? Because they want to rule from their symbolic north, which would be in the middle of the cross, basically. Wow. So Jupiter, Zeus, being the king of kings, he has a vested interest in knowing where that sacred center is, because then his rules and his laws and stuff can emanate to the furthest reaches of his empire from that sacred center. And from that sacred center, they also believed they unified heaven and earth. We almost don't even have an understanding of this anymore. To me, being a king, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, uh, I, it just, it's evolved, my opinion of what a king actually meant. But way back in the day, kings had this idea that they united heaven and earth together and that they were mm -hmm. actually unifiers. That was their role. And mm -hmm. there's a whole metaphysical, spiritual sort of dynamic going on there, right? And so they believe that they united heaven and earth. This is referred to as uh, what some people have called the great triad. This is an ancient Chinese sort of dynamic that heaven and earth are actually in a triune relationship with you, with man. We are the third thing. We are sort of that central axis that bridges the gap between the above and the below. My understanding is the magician card, when he's holding up his wand and he's pointing it to the heavens and he's pointing mm -hmm. his hand down below, he yep. is saying, I bind and I separate all that is above with all that is below. I just did a presentation on this too about the magician card and how he is that link between the above and the below, that he is the third thing in that Trinity relationship between heaven and earth. We are that third thing. Kings believe that they were the third thing and that when they ruled from the center of their land or kingdom, that they uh, are that bridge between uh, heaven and earth for their people, basically. So um, there's also other myths where eagles are related to the center of earth as well. So in uh, India, there's this uh, mythology about a central world mountain, and they wrap this large serpent around this world mountain, and then they basically, uh, two sets of demigods, pulled this uh, snake back and forth. And so they were churning the cosmic ocean, creating ambrosia, which is like the nectar of the gods, sort of like an elixir of life kind of thing. And it was an eagle that took this nectar and um, took it in a pot and traveled across India. 
it dropped several drops of ambrosia across India. And now those locations are sacred center locations where they have uh, these large festivals every three or four years called the Kumela, basically. And so Zeus also turned himself into an eagle to seduce a young man, basically, who is indicative or kind of emblematic of Aquarius. He's like the water bearer, basically. So there's a lot of symbolism with the eagle, the center, um, Zeus, kings, um, and, and kind of like this nectar of immortality, which I think Aquarius kind of embeds that too, um, being, um, the water bearer, you know, Aquarius, uh, isn't just related to water. It's related to all sorts of other things that can be contained within a pot. So this to me is all very fascinating. And this is where this location right here is where they put their Amphalo stone. Um, although the thing that I don't get maybe is that, um, the Omphalos is really heavily related to um, Delphi and Delphi is like on land. And this clearly looks like a Island. <clears throat> and so I don't really know what that's all about, but the, uh, the Omphalos represents the navel uh, or the center of earth basically. And so that's what he was trying to accomplish by sending out these Eagles is like, where is the center of everything? And that's where he's standing pretty much. And actually now that I think about it, he kind of looks like he's supposed to represent the central axis. It almost looks like he's supposed to represent the world tree or something along those lines. And then he's also showing a bit of his leg there too. <laughs> on the right. So yep. I think that might be deliberate. Yep. Yeah, there is something with birds where, uh, you know, that is a good point right there that, I mean, they, they do seem to understand like almost like ley lines from like the sky or like they use that almost like as maps to like understand like right. where they are. So that is interesting. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Also, I'll say with the number four and the cross and everything else, Christ was crucified on a cross. He was known as the king of kings, basically. And then also... What is the Jupiter glyph? What number does the Jupiter glyph look like? A four. Right? A number four. Right. Yeah. So it's a deep, deep weave. Yeah, that's even where the fourth sphere on the tree of life, that's where Jupiter would fall, too. Would fall. It was on mm -hmm. the fourth sphere. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, and, and, and the king. The king, uh, you'd start kind of getting in that area. Um, you know, like the tarot cards with stuff like that on there. Uh, right, right. Uh, one thing I do find interesting with his emblems, I, I wanted to mention it before I forget. Um, I think you will, a few times you will see him play off, I think, eagles too. Yeah. You know, like I think right, that right. It's, it is like something that he does use in this book uh, more than once. So totally, totally. To think about with the I'll eagle. just say, I, I want to shout out this book. Um, it's Fundamental Symbols by Rene Ganon. Uh, this guy, I don't know if I've mentioned him so much on this channel yet, but this is the best um, symbologist in, of modern times, in my opinion. He, he gets it better than so many other people. This is a great compilation of articles that he wrote. He was born in the 18, I think, 80s, died in the 1950s. He's amazing. He influenced a lot of people. He has a lot of material in this book. That's absolutely incredible. And he's one of the people that I came across this idea that Modern kings are emulating a hyperborean northern polar king. That's the dynamic, you know. So that's why he's concerned with where the center of Earth is, basically. And you can look and imagine the north being in the middle of a cross, basically. The point in which you cross over. You know, that's why I think we see a lot of crosses, you know, in cemeteries and everything else. It's about crossing over that central mm -hmm. axis in the middle of the vertical and horizontal arm. That's the point of pivot. That is the bridge between realms. That is how you transition to the other side, actually, in my opinion. So it I reminds me of the, the book. It Go reminds ahead. me of the Kabbalistic cross ritual. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's true. You're you making that. Yeah, that is true. The power and the glory. Yeah, you basically make yourself in the sign of a cross and expand yourself out to the top and bottom of the universe and then outsideward so that you could, uh, you know, receive the divine energy through you. Totally. Yeah. Be, be that fifth point, number yes. five, relating to spirit, right? Yes. Yeah. Like totally. Totally. Yep. Nice, nice, guys. Fun. Well, this is fun. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, does anybody got anything? I really don't got much on this one. I mean... I'm thinking I'm fine yeah. with that. Uh, are we all good then with this? Yeah, Mario got this one awesome. good. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I'm solid, man. All right, awesome, nice. I'm going to pull this down. and. Uh... All right, so uh, thank you very much for making that happen. That really, truly was fun. I had a great, great time. Um, 
definitely some interesting artwork to look at. Uh, I, like I said, I am hoping in the future, uh, you know, who knows, it could be months from now, but eventually, uh, hopefully cover some of the artwork that actually dropped today on the channel. If you go check it out, uh, that book is actually in 4K quality uh, YouTube. Uh, I got my own pictures and my own video footage of the books myself from the Beinecke Library. So uh, definitely check that out if you haven't yet, if you're coming by for the live. Um, and before we wrap it up, uh, Mario, let everybody know where they can find all your amazing work again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, SymbolicStudies.com. And then from there, you can find my social media stuff. And I also am available for tarot readings and things of that sort. So if I can help you on your symbolic journey in any way, shape or form, just reach out. Awesome. Thank you very much. And if your notes, uh, your links are not in the show notes, uh, they will be after I'm off of here, but I'm sure they are like usual. And Megan, let everybody know where they can find your channel as well. Hey guys. So my main uh, social media is Instagram. That's my favorite one that I like to use. I'm also on uh, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. So that's seven degrees, the number, just like it is on the screen here. Degrees of wisdom. 81 is a tag for my YouTube channel. I'm trying to grow my channel. It's all about magic, the paranormal. I've got some tarot stuff on there if you guys are interested in all that. I basically put up my retired classes on my YouTube channel. Um, so if you guys are interested in, in more, you know, occult subject matter, you can go ahead and subscribe to me over there. I'd really appreciate it. I'm also available for online services like mentoring, private tarot classes, and uh, private tarot readings as well. Um, I'll have my link tree in the description below, and you guys could click on that and get a hold of me that way. I've had a blast, you guys. Thank you so much for having you on. We need to do this more often. Oh, yeah. um, I really like working with you guys on stuff like this. Yes, for sure. It's always a blast. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I love having you. It's something I wanted to add, too, before I wrap it up. You know, all three of us, I think, look at this stuff from, like, a different angle. And in my opinion, I also think that these pieces of art probably have 10 more other angles to be looked at as well. Uh, I do think, mm -hmm. you know, people that I'm going to cover with them, I do think is is you know their artwork is that embedded which is why i try to get all these different angles to look at it um and just you know something to throw in there just so it doesn't seem so off the wall with some of the stuff i do cover if you go back to you know some of these people that we cover in the 15 1600s in other books that they put out that may not be as famous they sometimes will reference back to like actual parts of the body and it shows that they were interested in that or they were rubbing elbows with people who were like were literally drawing what the eyeball looks like in the 1600s, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, even though it seems a little bit wild to, to start thinking that maybe that stuff's in there, that stuff has been an interest around these people for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So just try to keep that in mind. I think that's just one of many, many different layered ways of looking at it. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, thank you all for uh, Mario and uh, Megan for coming on. And thank you, everybody, for uh, in being in the chat. That is what's up. That's why I go live. There was tons and tons of stuff in there. Unfortunately, I had to be a little busy myself, so I couldn't keep up on the chat and post everything, but I tried. But uh, if you're going to catch the replay of the live, definitely tech check out the chat for this one. Great stuff as usual. The usual suspects were here. Um, and that is the end of another Occult Rejects. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.